the Evolution Security Podcast. Welcome to the Evolution Security Podcast, where we give you the knowledge and live training to protect yourself, your family, and your country. This episode is brought to you in part by Tenacor. Tenacor is an American design, development, manufacturing, and training company building products that work. They are innovators that come from a law enforcement and training background with years of experience. We would specifically suggest that you look at the new Velo 4 AWIB holster. Everyone on this podcast owns one and uses it regularly. For 10% off your purchase, use the code EVOSEC at checkout. That's E-V-O-S-E-C at checkout for 10% off. Lastly, if you like what you hear here, please give us a review. It really helps to keep up our ratings and get the word out to others. You can find us online on Instagram at EVOSECUSA and Facebook, also EVOSECUSA, or visit our website, evosec.org, that's E-V-O-S-E-C dot O-R-G, where you can find bios of the staff and links to upcoming events and trainings. Now for the show. Hey, welcome to the show, everyone. Joined by Eric and Aaron. Unfortunately, we are not in the same room today. That was sure a treat last time, but how are you guys doing? Doing great. I, I did enjoy that a lot last time. That was a blast making that show. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and I, I'm certainly doing well hanging out with you guys as always. But that uh, all in the same room was uh, was so much fun, and, uh, you know, we got to, you know, see each other's faces. We're talking to each other, which kind of, in all honesty, helped with the rolling of the show. So good to be with you guys. Oh, it sure did. Oh, yeah, it sure did. Now I'm already looking forward to getting together and doing trainings like that again. Well, we're going to start out with a quote like we usually do. And this is a quote by Milton Friedman. A society that puts equality before freedom will get neither. A society that puts freedom before equality will get a high degree of both. And I think it's very relevant to where we're at today. And of course, he said this quite a while ago, but I, I have concerns that we're seeing our society taking some of that former path there. What, uh, what do you think about that, Aaron? Well, I'll tell you, um, there often equality means that the lesser people are the ones that get the equality. And that usually means what the um, the leadership and the government don't want. In other words, when it comes to, again, gun control, people that have armed guards all around them want to prescribe to us that we shouldn't have arms to protect ourselves, and that's the equality for the little people. I'll tell you what, that, that's what comes to mind a lot to me when when I hear politicians talk about equality and it can also be considered spreading the most misery around for the most people well and i'll just how about you eric yeah well i'll just hit on that as well aaron and you hit on the the second amendment liberty um and and, you know i really believe that like brian stated that we are kind of heading in the direction where equality is being sold as this utopian idea. And we know that throughout history that any type of implementation of that kind of equality has ended, like you stated, Aaron, in misery. And so well, you know, we want to avoid that. I mean, just, just look at China, look at, look at Russia, look at any of the countries that have implemented that type of equality under an iron fist liberty is is definitely not present at all 
So de- definitely important for us to kind of reflect on that and, and especially with whom we vote for and the things that we espouse to our friends and family to, to be important. Good feedback, guys. Yeah, that's uh, definitely something that uh, gives you a little cause for pause to think about which way things should work because we all want everyone to be happy and we all want everyone to get their fair share, but there definitely comes a point where um, those lines don't converge on a benefit for, for the whole. So something definitely to think about. So, Well, and, and I'd like to say that Milton Friedman, if people aren't aware of who he is, um, an amazing economist, maybe the one of the most important economists of the last century, century and a half, if you're interested in economics, you should definitely look him up and, and get some of his readings. And guys, if I can if I can add one last thing just really quick is we have different industry, we have different capabilities, we have different desires, different motivations, and different stations in life throughout the world. And therefore, how can you implement true equality? It, it's just uh, it's an impossibility. It's true. Well, hey, we're going to talk about um, some self-defense cases, as we have done in the past, but we're going to do it a little different tonight. Um, I definitely want to credit where we uh, got this stuff was uh, from the USCCA website, which is the United States Concealed Carry Association. Um, They compiled these, and we'll let you know where the stories came from as well, but we definitely want to give them a shout-out for for doing the work, for rounding this stuff up, because uh, as we'll discuss a little bit later, sometimes... It's hard to find these stories, and I, we'll talk about that later. But <laughs> anyhow, we've uh, selected a few, and these are all current events. So these have all happened like in the last month or so. Um, none of these are like from years ago. A lot of times people will pick up stories that are from quite a while ago, and although they're relevant, these are all um, current things that have happened in the past, you know, like I say, uh, 30 to 90 days. So we'll uh, start it off with a uh, domestic dispute. Indiana woman shoots in self-defense. An Indianapolis woman resorted to a pistol when an argument with her boyfriend turned violent. When the boyfriend pointed a pistol at her, the woman drew her own gun and fired on the man. One hit landed and ended the incident. Police are investigating the incident as a self-defense shooting. And that came from Fox 59 TV in Indianapolis, Indiana. The next one, Arizona armed Good Samaritan foils kidnapping attempt of 11-year-old girl. An 11-year-old Phoenix girl was walking to school about 7.30 a.m. when a strange man grabbed her, pinned her arm behind her back, and put his other arm across her face. Seeing what was happening, a nearby citizen armed approached the man, knocked him down, and pointed his pistol at him. The assailant then fled on foot. Phoenix police have undertaken an extensive hunt with the would-be kidnapper. Now, story was uh, originally posted by the Arizona Republic in Phoenix, Arizona. Next, a Florida food truck crew defends against armed robbers. A food truck was parked in northwest Miami one morning when an armed man approached and demanded money of a woman working inside. Hearing the commotion, the truck's driver approached the robbery scene. While handing money over to the robber, he's able to get his own pistol and fire putting the robber to flight. A good Samaritan then tackled the suspect and held him for police. Meanwhile, two persons in a nearby parked car fired on the food truck. The driver returned fire, hitting one of the occupants, who promptly fled the scene. Police later apprehended both suspects. No one in the food truck was injured. That was uh, originally reported on NBC Channel 6 TV in Miramar, California. Next, we have an Arizona grandmother shoots home invader. A Cortis Lakes grandmother was home with her husband and three young grandchildren at 7.30 one evening when an unknown male broke into the dwelling. He demanded money, got into a fight with the husband, and refused to leave. While the intruder struggled with her husband, the grandmother retrieved a handgun, confronted the intruder with it, and ordered him to leave. When he advanced on her instead of leaving, the woman fired on him striking him at least once and causing him to flee. Police found the wounded intruder at a nearby home where he had collapsed from non-life-threatening injuries. And that was from ABC 15 News, Phoenix, Arizona. 
And lastly, another Arizona story. Arizona man kills one, seriously wounds another home invader. A Phoenix man heard noises of a possible intruder to his home about 1 a.m. When he investigated, he found two men trying to break into his residence. He fired on the duo, killing one and seriously wounding the other. And that was from Fox News 10 in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So it looks like we're getting a lot of activity in Arizona. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there's, <laughs> you know, apparently there's a lot of lot going on there. But anyhow, um, did... Uh, did you want to pick that up, Eric, and uh, maybe give some feedback on on any of those in specific? Sure, absolutely. And it and it really boils down to as I as I see and read these stories and we discuss them. One of the most important factors that stuck out to me is this child being kidnapped, and the thought of you know being a parent myself. Of course, my son has grown in the Marine Corps now, but thinking that he could have been out in public, maybe outside of, of our vision, or maybe he was out with friends, so on and so forth, man, I'm glad that there would be an armed person that could, you know, defend my son back when, you know, he was, he was young. So I wonder what other parents that may even be anti-gun think of that, think of that story, because man, I, I certainly would be thankful if that person was there for sure. So that stuck out to me. And Boy, it really did to me too, Eric. And and because j- just think, nearly one hundred percent, this girl would have been murdered. That that's how these things go down. They don't just kidnap them, um, you know, just to hang out with them. I mean, it, it's it's serious. And yes, a gun saved that girl's life. So the anything uh, else, Eric? Yeah, I'm sorry. Absolutely. So the the Arizona grandmother. Um, one thing that that stuck out to me is the fact that she she grabbed her gun and pointed it at the suspect. And what did he do? He didn't tuck tail and run. He he ran to or excuse me, approached her. At least is what it said. So you know, it's just a good reminder that. Just because there's a presence of a gun and you have one, you have to be ready to use it. And, you know, the apex predator may not care if you have a pistol or a gun or whatnot. That just may be a challenge to them to um, aggress you and take it from you. You know, they're thinking, how dare you point that at me? I'm going to take it from you and use it against you. So we have to be ready to fire. So that, that was the other one that really stuck out to me. Good feedback, man. And that is uh, really good points in that. Uh, I do, too, you know, and reading it, but hearing you guys talk about it as parents, you know, that that kid one really hits hard. Um, the other one that uh, struck me was the food truck deal. You know, they'd uh, the, the guy actually doing the strong arm part had been taken out of the equation and subdued. And his partner start shooting rounds at the food truck. And that driver had the ability to return fire and hit one of them. That is impressive. Uh, It's also downright scary that you've got somebody doing this type of robbery. The guy that they sent up to do the deed, so to speak, has been taken down. And the guys in the car don't just flee. They don't just, you know tuck tail and, and, you know, leave their buddy for, for down. No, they start shooting. That is not the type of person you want to be on the backside of. I mean, that is, that just goes to show you that there is that type of criminal out there and I'm sure that they're not the only ones, you know? So the fact that these guys, you know, and pretty much all of these stories were armed and had the ability to deploy their weapons had had anything gone differently in these, had those people not had the ability to defend themselves with a firearm, it is highly likely that someone would have been gravely injured and none of those people apprehended. You know, that's the other beauty of this is in all except, unfortunately, one of the scariest ones, the, the 11-year-old girl deal, in every other one of those, we've got arrests. We've got guys actually picked up and taken off the street. So that's that's the thing that I also like about that is not only was a, a gun used to stop the violent act, but in the process of that discourse, 
they also were taken into custody. This is also a reminder to all of our listeners that you need to be armed whenever possible. It, it simply amazes me the amount of people that I run into that have a concealed carry permit and they leave their gun in their car all the time. They leave their gun at home. They, um, they, they, don't, they don't understand that, that they will never choose when they need that firearm. They, they can't just feel like today's not a day I'm going to need to use my firearm. It, it could be any day of your life, so you need to carry every day of your life. And carry as long as you can, including in your home. Now, some people, that might be paranoid, but that is the that is a safer way to be, even in your home. Now, one of the, the main issues, again, that sticks out to me is that the lack of death rays used in these. Now, I'm not going to belabor this, but in every single one of these cases, except for one, the perpetrator survived. And in most of them, they were hit and ran off or simply ran off when, when the gun was presented. Now, um, one last thing um, that I would like to say is on this last one that we were talking about where the gentleman, it says he went to investigate when he heard some noises. Now, we can only assume that that meant that he went to, you know, left his, his safe bedroom or some place where he had distance between these individuals to go look for these individuals. What do you guys think from that? Well, I, for one, uh, you, you know, a lot of people think that that's the best route to take when the reality plays out over and over again. Probably one of the best responses to that. If you do not have young children in another room, or have another reason that you have to, to, to look for those individuals or, or what noise went bump in the night, the, the best bet is to go ahead and hold up, call 911, have yourself a good ambush point within your bedroom, preferably something that can sustain rounds that's actual cover, and wait for the police to come check it out. Because that that's a bad situation to be in, a solo searching of a home. It, you know, the, the odds, the odds, unfortunately, are in the favor of a person hiding, waiting on you. So that's just yeah, one of the things that, that, that sticks out to me in that. Go ahead, Aaron. Well, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm just assuming, again, that's what I was saying. I'm, an, I'm assuming that this person went out to go look for them. So, um, so we, we can only speculate on that. But that, those were my main thoughts was that, yes, never go out and search for anybody even if you've got you know thirty rounds of two twenty three in your in your AR fifteen, like like I like to recommend, there is absolutely no reason to search in your house. Now, for me, I've got I've got kids across the house, and if if there's if my alarm goes off, I'm making my way to their rooms. But boy, whenever they get out of the house, I'm locking my bedroom door every night and waiting for that alarm to go off and holding up and calling the police, just like you suggested, Eric. Well, Aaron, if I can circle back to, to one other point that you made about making sure that you carry your firearm. There was a scenario that Tom Givens speaks about. You know, he's had probably some of the best uh, evidence of students that have been in shootings and defended themselves. Most certainly. And, and, and one, I think he said two of his um, students had been in fights and they lost. And in both cases, I hope I got that right, Tom. You can. It, it was correct. three. Okay, it was, it was three. three. Um, that that lost, and it was because they were not armed. And one of those incidents uh, was a gentleman that left his pistol in his car because I think there was an it was a supposed gun free zone or something in a, in a park maybe. I hope I had the details correct, but unfortunately, he was accosted by a gentleman. I believe there was a dispute over uh, an incident with his dog, and he pulls out a pistol and executes the guy in front of his, um, I believe, his daughter. 
And that's a prime example. You know, if that gentleman would have had his gun on him, maybe he would still be alive today. So the other um, approximately 60 cases of his students that have been in shootings, each one of them had their gun and each one of them won their fight. And I believe he, he said maybe one or maybe two were injured, but of course not gravely. So yeah, any, anyone that wants to know about real life gun um, fights um, and statistics on that and, and get some amazing training to help yourself out um, in a normal street um, shooting scenario, Tom Givens is an amazing instructor and you can get a lot of amazing information from him. Good stuff, man. I really, uh, I really appreciate when we do this together because, you know, we bring, you know, they are our opinions and I'm sure our audience has their own and, uh, you know, definitely reach out to us in social media and stuff if you want to further follow up any of this stuff. But it is, it's neat to, to get those extra perspectives and to look at these th problems through a different set of eyes and understand how someone else would look at it, you know, so that's, uh, or something that we may have, that I may have missed, you know, that you guys uh, bring up and and really really makes me think about the problem differently and how to how to solve the problem. And I agree with the you know uh, the holding up theory. You know, definitely if there is no specific need to exit a safe location, you should not do so just because you heard something. You know, um, if you've got uh, you know, dogs that are barking or, uh, you know, something like that outside, that, that doesn't mean go to your front door and turn the light on. Well, now they know where you are. You know, that's, that's, that's one thing you're, you're giving away your, your concealability. So definitely agree though on the kids stuff. You know, if you've, uh, if you've got kids in the home, move, move everyone to a safe location if you can. And then definitely, um, before you do that though, if you really think there's an issue, you, Call nine one one immediately. There's a lot of things that happen, and it's it's the lack of acting that creates these these unnecessary sad outcomes. And we definitely want to try and help people avoid those. So we uh, talk about all the carry and the use and the deployment of force. Those really are last resorts, though. That is not what we want to preach as your first approach because that is a, a good way to not necessarily wind up on top, even though, even though just like you say, with all these stories of these, uh, the person who carried prevailed, that is not the situation that we get up in the morning looking for. That is the last thing that we want to happen. So, um, just bear that in mind that this is not, uh, getting your mindset ready to en embrace one of those situations is not the same as looking for a fight. And uh, none of us on here are looking for a fight. But, not, not at all. Um, and, and I think, yeah. Brian, you're doing a really good segue into one of the main topics, aren't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, indeed. <laughs> and, you know, there's uh, the best scenario for... A situation, you know, say, say I walk, and I think I've used this scenario before, you, you walk out of a grocery store, and it's late at night, and you're heading to your car, and you notice two guys start beelining you to your car. Engaging them, or trying to race them to your car, or drawing on them, where you're still 20 yards away, and you could just turn around and walk back into the store. Walking back into the store is the right solution. You know, when you become engaged with someone and cannot disengage, then we start moving into these other skills. And that's, that's what we're going to work on uh, talking about today. And we'll get into some of this stuff in depth in future shows. But we're going we're gonna to go over some of our basic training for what we offer and give you some like the top five, the top five skills that, that one, we would want you to have and two, we, we could teach you if you come to a class. And I'm going to turn it over to Eric because he really is kind of our instruction core coordinator. He, you know, we, we all want to help and, and help everyone learn. But, but Eric is really, you know, driving behind writing the curriculum here and probably has the most training experience out of, out of the three of us, too. So that's why we default to him on that's this. Correct. But uh, 
man and, and, and really doing a great job at putting this together. So, um, why don't you, uh, why don't you take it for a while there, buddy? Th thanks a lot, Brian. And I'm humbled. I, I really appreciate those nice comments, but it certainly is nice. You guys, um, you guys are my peers in all this too. So, um, I, I really appreciate that. So, Essentially, what we're going to go over now is what we believe in evolution security as being the top five training essentials or areas that you should focus on. And I'd like to say first is that folks that say are new to um, getting into self-defense and especially when it comes around firearms, it, it, it tends to be daunting to, to some folks. And what we like to do is try to, you know, guide folks into what they should be focusing on and, and kind of areas where they can get this training. So, again, this is just the start of this discussion, um, you know, these top five. And we're going to get more and more detailed as uh, several shows down the road. And we, we also have more than five. So. In case somebody comes up, comes around and says, hey, what about medical? Well, we're going to talk about medical too. But um, without further ado, these are our top five in order of precedence or priority. The first is verbalization, de-escalation, and deselection skills. That We want to avoid the fight altogether. Number two, physical fitness. Number three, empty hands or combatives. Four, mindset. And then lastly, of the top five is weapons, and specifically in this case, a pistol. So moving forward in uh, getting to a little more details, let's talk about the verbalization piece. So uh, all three of us are... are students and alumni of, of Craig Douglas's ECQC and one of the most important or the most important portion of that class is called Managing Unknown Contacts. That's uh, Craig's term. So I'm going to give attribution to that. So essentially it is managing folks that are possibly encroaching on you, moving towards you to use um, Brian's example earlier. That would be an example of encroachment individuals that are engaging you in conversation, you don't know what their intention is, whether they mean you harm or they're just innocent. That is extremely, extremely important. As a matter of fact, just like I stated, it is the most important factor, mainly because number one, space is crucial to having the reaction time needed to effectively defend oneself in case of an ambush. Knowing how criminals act and or display body ticks or subconscious movement and body language can save your life. So all of these factors, again, are the most important uh, area to work on to keep you safe and keep you alive. Well, to, to get good at this, you, you have to drill this. So um, we won't go into too many details, but essentially... You have to work with individuals, training partners that are going to approach you and, 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 and have dialogue with you. And managing that encroachment is crucial. You have to drill it. So moving on to uh, physical fitness as number two. The number one killer is not murder. It's heart disease. And then also other forms of health issues that can be avoided or postpone uh, with being fit. Most important is cardiovascular health and endurance. If you do not have the conditioning to be able to negotiate a fight before it goes lethal, or excuse me, negate a fight before it goes lethal, and you can't even get to the tool if needed, what good is that tool or weapon, you know, in this case? Okay, set the second fitness component is strength. Strength makes you flat out harder to kill. 
both as it relates to physical altercation, your bone density, and fending off frailty in your later days. Some basic beginner um, levels of fitness might simply be, I think most important is everybody should be able to uh, get on a treadmill or a bike, um, whatever modality of, uh, of cardio that you choose, and on command be able to be able to do 30 minutes at a 110 or 120 to 140 beats per minute heart rate. I mean, that's just basic physical conditioning. What would be even better is if, you know, two to, th two to three times a week, you can do that for 60 minutes. One of the methods I like to use, because that can be a little bit boring, because that's not a, a real high output. What I like to use is Joel Jameson's uh, road work 2.0, which is essentially you can choose all the multiple modalities that you have available to you, either at your, your gym or your home gym, anything from jump rope, a rower, a bike, a treadmill, kettlebell, so on and so forth. So that, that's what I like to do if I'm, if I'm, you know, going for that long sustained cardiovascular and uh, as far as basic strength goes, and then I'm going to bring in my two other hosts to, to kind of hit on physical fitness here. As a, as a basic uh, strength, or excuse me, as a, as a basic measurement of strength, everybody that's on this path should at a minimum be able to do, say, 10 push-ups, one pull-up, 20 bodyweight squats, 30 crunches. I mean, if somebody starts with trying to gain, you know, just those basic capabilities, because we may be talking about individuals that have, you know, been out of shape for a long time or, or they've never really been physical, that that's certainly a good, good place to start. And I would argue that maybe at an, at an average or above average, you know, this is something to aim for is five dips, five pull ups. Squat body rate, excuse me, squat your body weight times 10 and deadlift um, times 10 of your body weight, that is. So those those are just a few uh, basic fitness measurements that, that, that I think is easily attainable. And at a later show, we'll, we'll go into some more, more advanced capabilities and, and, and get a little more specific on what we do ourselves. So... Um, uh, go, go ahead, Brian. What's your thoughts on the fit, the fitness piece of this? Well, it is huge, and I see um, I see stuff online, and we've got some kind of you know, I, there, we all know the term armchair warrior, and there's plenty of them out there, and I'm sure they have some great defensive skills, and that they can draw a pistol fast. But if you can't get out of your own way, that's a problem. And it's something you want to work on. And we all, we want to be inclusive here. You know, everybody starts from a different path and everyone can improve on where they're at. Um, I can improve myself. I mean, there's definitely, this is a huge piece of this puzzle. Um, I do agree with your, uh, you know, your basic strength things, you know, there's, uh, and, and just to clarify too, um, when he's talking about squatting your body weight times 10, he means 10 reps with as much as you weigh on your back, not 10 thank, times. You, your thank you very much. Brian. I was like, wow, <laughs> so, that's really high. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I realize now that you that's a lot of goal. Ryan, the way that <laughs> came off. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, no, all good. <laughs> I understood what you meant, but some folks may not understand what you meant. And, you know, in the, in the, lesser, in the lesser version, 20 body weight squats, and he's meaning... 20 squats in a row at a good pace at a full depth just standing not 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 with any load and then in the above average you would do that with the load of your body weight 10 times and i can do all of those things i can do the dips i can do the pull ups i can do the the dev and and more and that's because i've been training um and you know one of the things that we talked about before, one of the, my favorite quotes that we've ever had on the show is the way is in training. And that is so true there. I'm doing things in training that was never even a goal because I am training. I've learned that these things are capable of being done by me 
not just by some guy I see on TV or some muscle head at the gym. I am, I'm lean. I am not heavy. I am not yoked. And I can do much more than this above average that he's talked about. You know, when you want to get into advanced, that's where we start talking about, okay, let's start doing some big deadlift weight. Let's start doing pull-ups with a weighted vest. Let's uh, run a mile and then test our pistol skills. Let's, you know, do, do, the t- do the pistol skill test cold, warm up, do the pistol skill test run a mile, do the pistol skill test, see where you're at on those things and watch what happens to you when those things happen, you know? And that's one thing that we're actually talking about doing more of is, is doing some of this physical training and then deploying tests on ourselves when we're warmed up and tired, because just like saying, you don't get to pick the day, you know, I might get in a fight today. I should probably carry a gun. Same thing. You may be tired or exhausted, or you may have been required to flee when you go into that. So this is part of that, you know, just building your mental stuff. And that's, I'm I'm getting a little ahead of the training here, but that is, that's the reason for having this physical fitness. Because the best shooter in the world, if you're in the wrong position and you don't have your physical fitness with you, that pistol skill is not going to save And Brian, if I can add to that. If your ticker can't handle the adrenaline dump and the physical altercation that, that takes place or the, the physiological effects on your body in a fight for your life, then um, what good is what good is that blaster? Um, <clears throat> so, so, Aaron, what's your thoughts on the physical fitness pieces as we rate it as being second of an importance? I like to say, guys, um, sorry to the gun guys, but the most important aspects of self-defense you can't hold in your hands. There, It's all effort um, in, in your mental capacity and your um, in your physical abilities. Speaking of the physical um, abilities um, and physical fitness, I, I think we'd be remiss in, in, in overlooking diet. Um, now I, I, for one, do not have a perfect diet, but I have made uh, the great accountability that we've started, um, with this podcast and even before that, but you do not have to have a perfect diet to, to be fit. You may want to work on your diet, um, very intently. If you're working on a competition or something, we all love food. Am I right guys? Absolutely. But, but you can make decisions. Uh, to me, the best way for me to stay lean are two things. Don't eat anything past my dinner and, don't, and to also do intermittent fasting um, a couple of times a week. Those are things that are not that hard. And to be honest, I basically eat whatever I want. I, I don't eat cheese or anything like that, but... I'll tell you what, I eat a lot of eggs, I eat a lot of bacon, I eat a lot of stuff cooked in coconut oil, and I can tell you, my blood work is off the charts. Actually, let's not say off the charts, let me back that up. My blood work at my age is actually perfect, and that's after eating eating two or three years worth of lots of bacon. So, it's all good. Well, I do definitely want to point out that I have been told that using that uh, coconut oil is great for kale because once you cook it, it makes it easier to scrape it into the garbage. <laughs> it's, um, I thought you were going... <laughs> the, <laughs> sorry, everybody. <laughs> I should awesome. throw that in there. The, uh, I, and I'll just backing up what Aaron just said. I, um, I started this path um, seriously. You know, I'd, I'd done plenty of things and shot plenty and whatnot, but... I really seriously started this path that I've kind of evolved to on now, probably pushing three years ago, been doing the CrossFit for two and a half years. And I came in with ridiculously high triglycerides. I mean, like normal level is like 250 and below. And I mean, we're talking 800 to a thousand and some people just run high on those. But after two years of CrossFit, I eat all the steak I want and being fit, doing these other things my levels are now normal and my doctor can't figure it out. And I'm like, 
well, I do a lot of workouts. And he's like, yeah, but you changed that number dramatically. And I'm like, okay. He said, just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, my heart condition's fine. I, I tested fine on treadmill, all that stuff. So it's, it, it works. You know, when your PE teacher told you in high school, if you could work out for an hour, two to three times a week, you're, you know, it's going to make a big difference in your life. They it's a lifestyle, is it not, guys? It sure is, and, and, and I Absolutely. just really got to sometimes still even these more basic things can be intimidating to somebody. I'll tell you what, they are intimidating to me, you know, um, four, five, six years ago, but I've worked into it. And, and again, I do not work out like you guys, but I can tell you on, on all of these items, I'll tell you, to be flat honest, the only thing I can't do is the pull-up. <laughs> I, I can do it with some. We're working on that. Fair though, enough. We? Yes, we are. But everything else I've got down. So, um, so again, there's a little bit of pre accountability there. But yeah, um, th this is good stuff. I, I see the five pull ups coming up in your in your near future, brother. That's awesome. <laughs> I'll work towards it, buddy. Well, excellent. So, uh, mo moving on. And let, let me, by the way, let me circle back to something you said, Brian, just thinking about what you said about your triglycerides and, and, uh, you know, I'm assuming you might, maybe cholesterol could, could have been an issue as well. I don't know. Um, so, so oh, one yeah, of the things high. that continues to get a bad name is fat. And I think that's from the years of the, of the food pyramid, uh, having that lopsided, carbohydrates at the bottom you know this huge carbohydrates and not that carbs are bad but um fat is not that bad for you if you're if you're not cramming it with a bunch of other carbohydrates and and other junk and not and not exercising so i had a similar issue when when i started eating more fats for my my calories and my doctor couldn't believe all my cholesterol and triglycerides went down like 20 25 points and she couldn't understand why and i said you know, I changed changed the way I eat regarding uh, I eat more fats, and she couldn't believe it. But uh, that's the story for another day. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, m moving on. So as far as our third of importance is going to be uh, basic empty hands and combatives. Again, we still haven't made it to a weapon yet because. In the order of importance is, is empty hands capabilities is next on the list of what you're more than likely going to use in self-defense. So bottom line is you, you don't want to go to a weapon if you can keep from it. it. It may very well be justified. But if you get into a situation and your, your um, verbal, verbalization de-escalation or your awareness has failed you, it's more than likely that you're going to have to use some grappling or maybe even a minor strike or, or something to get you moving in a control position, either to get the heck out, you know, use the Nike foo. And there's no shame in that. Um, we definitely want to get the heck out of Dodge if we can. But if you do end up having to where you have to use your self-defense for real, you're going to want some empty hand skills. And what do we recommend on, out of EvoSec or Evolution Security? All three of us recommend Jiu-Jitsu. That's right. Jiu-Jitsu jiu is one of the best places for everyone to start and, frankly, continue to train the rest of their lives. You can easily, depending on what your age is, your size, your fitness level, um, Anybody can train in jujitsu, and it it has a it is a requisite capability for uh, self defense. Uh, not only that, you can you can if you you might have to adjust the way you way you train and your training partners as you get older. I know I know I I do at forty six, and I choose my partners wisely. But you can train in jujitsu the rest of your life. So that's the reason we we recommend that, and not only that, it's everywhere, isn't it, guys? I mean, everywhere you you go, even in the 
smallest cities or towns, you can find a jiu-jitsu gym. So uh, second, I, I would say second on that list of, of empty hands would be uh, wrestling. And in all honesty, specifically the clinch and or Greco-Roman wrestling, which is more of the stand-up uh, grappling, hand fighting, uh, hand and body control that's very important in a weapons-based environment because isn't it the hands that kill guys? That's correct. And so we want to be able to oh, control yes. those hands and those limbs effectively. And also it helps us to be able to get to our tools as well. So anyway, that's uh, one of the biggest reasons why we recommend the, the clinch type work. So uh, hey, go ahead. I just kind of want to interject here that, you know, through the years, you know, different martial arts have been in fashion. Um, but with all the pressure testing that a lot of really good instructors have been doing and, you know, these, these really good empirical evidence laboratories, the interesting thing is I've noticed that striking arts – have gone out of favor and um now of course striking is important but what are your thoughts on that because i mean i know people like i listened to paul sharp the other day on um, another podcast and they asked him what his least favorite training was and he didn't even bat an eye he goes boxing yeah so uh, just just curious what your thoughts are on on striking versus these um these control positioning and, and, you know, body control um, movements? Well, most assuredly, Aaron, I, I don't really train in striking anymore at all myself. And, and I think um, you guys both know, I know you know for sure um, that I, I have an instructorship in, in uh, Thai boxing and it's something I really, really loved. And, but essentially, I don't train it anymore. I, I just don't feel the necessity to, to, to work on my, my striking skills anymore. Because, And I'll quote, you, you brought up uh, Paul Sharp. I, I like what he said. He said, the more time I spend striking, the more time it takes me to get my hands on you. And and I think that's a honestly a good philosophy. I'm not, I'm not stating that we shouldn't be able to strike and you may have to strike, but, uh, you know, you can break your hand hitting somebody in the face mm -hmm. and go it, ahead. It, it just, it just seems that, that striking is not as effective as, as limb and um, body control. I, I honestly agree. And, and you know, uh, again, mixed martial arts proves time and time again that, you know, there, there's a, there's one punch knockouts all the time, but let's face it. We're also talking about professional athletes. Now, now I, I should, I would be remiss if I would say that that doesn't happen on the street. Of course it does, but I would much rather be able to, to, to control, you know, the, the, the person I'm possibly engaged in a fight with. Much, it's much more important to make sure that if, if weapons do come into play, that I'm not sitting there worrying about, you know, boxing with a guy that just deployed a knife and I'm thinking I'm getting hit in the gut and I'm getting stabbed. So I, I would much rather control their limbs, bottom line. Mm -hmm. Now, and I don't want to, I don't want to completely discount striking. It is effective, but it's just that. It just, like you said, MMA shows that, I mean, there's, they box to keep each other from, from clinching them up and, and getting them in any sort of, um, grappling, um, you know, um, control. Am I right on that? In many cases, that's correct, Aaron. You know, and you do have the strikers that they're, that is their, their primary plan is to, is to knock the, their opponent out. So, but yeah, for the average citizen, though, we should be focusing on the grappling arts, plain and simple. Um, what's your thoughts, Brian? No, I definitely agree with you guys on that stuff. One of the other things to think about is if you get into 
a boxing match or a, you know, a, a punch throwing match with somebody, you could be the one getting knocked out. And that's where a lot of these other methods, you know, whether it's the Greco Roman or the Jiu Jitsu is if, if you can't flee, then I want to be yeah. right next to you because your ability to strike me is diminished greatly. I may be able to manipulate you in a fashion that you cannot strike me. And ideally, I could take control of you in a way that you could not escape and could not strike. That is the goal. Um, I'm not, you know, and if I can, you know, get lucky and choke you out at the same time, great. But that's not even my goal there. I really, you know, it's like uh, you talked about when you had your guest instructor there, Aaron. I want to put you into a control position where you mm-hmm. get tired. Oh yeah, and it was it was it was but, here on Gracie. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> so coming from someone like that, that makes that that means a lot to me. And it definitely um having done some of this live training, you know, whether it was with Craig or some of our, you know, our stuff in class there with instructor Will at uh at uh, Jiu Jitsu Dynamics, there's definitely you can see when you've got someone in a clinch, even if they can strike you, the effectiveness of that striking is so limited that, you know, and you're, and you're doing something that they don't want and probably can't defend against if they're not a trained, you know, in, in that art as well. So that's one of the things uh, to remember is if you have this type of training and skill nine times out of 10, if not more, you're going to, if you ever have to deploy it in a self-defense situation, the likelihood of that person having any of that training and being able to combat it. Oh yeah. And unlikely. They're gonna, I they're, mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, really unlikely. They're going to wonder why you're hugging on them. <laughs> hmm It is definitely, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. unexpected. It, when you get a crash and a clinch, you're yeah. like, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, man, that, that straight, <laughs> you know, either default position like um, Craig teaches, dude just crashing into someone's chest and, chest and clinching up with them. That's an amazing technique. Simply the, the clinch. Am I right, Eric? Most certainly. And here's one of the factors that Paul Sharp also talks about is is that we're going against people that are untrained. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that a person on the street doesn't have this tenacity and and fighting skills themselves. But the majority of the time, you're like, even if you're going to get some deranged jerk, um, you're likely going to have the, 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 the training to succeed. So, yeah, most, most assuredly. You guys got any, any, anything else to add on that? That's it for now. All right, so moving on. The fourth most important attribute we believe everybody should be working on is mindset. Now, again, mindsets, you know, talked about uh, quite esoterically, and sometimes there's no prescription in how to to develop mindset. And frankly, sometimes it's just, hey, you know, you got to have the mindset to be able to survive these incidents or defending yourself in in in, in these kind of uh, in these cases. Well, um, that's not telling folks a whole lot. Um, but frankly, how do we how do we develop mindset? Well, I would say that it's it's developed through doing tough things, facing tough challenges, and participating in tough training with like minded people. Frankly, I mean, when you're again, we we I don't want to beat a dead horse on the usage of of jujitsu and and wrestling, um, but we've hit on this before. We, we've hit on this before, it, you know, that that is a major mindset development tool is dealing with all the pressure that takes place in, in, in grappling arts. You know, lifting heavy things, lifting heavy weights, facing a, uh, a heavy set on the squat rack or deadlift or um, cleans sometimes is like, oh, man, I don't want to do this next set. But then you power through it, and, and it simply toughens the mind. But all of these tools, of course, there's other things in developing mindset, like 
of course, we know that putting yourself through scenario-based training is also a major tool in developing mindset. So, um, you know, we'll just go ahead and leave it at that. So moving on to the last of the attributes we're going to talk about this evening. Now we've finally made it to the weapon. So most importantly, we're not worried about getting a rifle just yet, even though we love them. For defense of yourself in public and parking lots, so on and so forth, we need a good pistol. Not only do we need a good pistol, we also need to be proficient with it. And as Aaron stated before, you need to actually carry it. I'll add that the pistol is definitely not, as Aaron says, a death ray or, or um, I, I think it was, um, Car- uh, excuse me, uh, Claude Werner, I believe, is the one that termed it, that it's not a talisman that wards off evil. I, I hope I have who stated that first. It's, it's not. It's not going to ward off evil. In one of the cases that we discussed earlier, the uh, grandmother pointed a pistol at a at a perpetrator in their home and he moved towards her. So again, it's not a talismus. So <clears throat> moving on to uh, what, what would you do to attain skills? Well, um, you can you can throw a rock and nearly find decent training throughout the United States. Now we, we live in an age right now where uh, the proliferation of decent and or superb training is available, you know, very, very close to most people. So you need to, you need to seek out a reputable level one pistol class and train, continue to train. You, you go to that class, you're only making a down payment on it to, to, to quote, James Yeager, and then you got to make payments on it. The second tool to getting proficient with your pistol is dry fire. Everybody needs to dry fire. I mean, it's free training, and and frankly, it's one of the best tools to develop your um, firearms manipulation techniques and trigger press. So dry fire at least two to, excuse me, two to three times a week. Better yet, is it? And, and by the way, no, you won't break your gun. No, you won't. <laughs> That's a that I think that comes from the archive of of twenty two uh, two twenty two long rifle or rim fire. Uh, so some moving on to okay, what are some basic skills? Now again, these are basic, but this is a starting point. We just got through going through a whole series of using the B8 bull. Well, that's a great place to start. 10 yards, slow fire, 10 rounds, 50 points or better. You know, we we proved with the majority of the people that gave us feedback on that drill, that that was fairly easy to attain. What's also attainable, we had many of both both ourselves and and some of our other folks that gave us feedback that were shooting well into the 90s and, and, and 100 points in several cases. So that's a good good place to start. You'd have to start at 10, 10, excuse me, 10 yards, but that's simply just a, a good attainment is to, to be able to shoot decently accurate at 10 yards. And as far as one of our new um, favorite drills, at least I can speak for myself, one of my new favorite tests was one of the ones we just prescribed a couple of podcasts to go and that's the test, which is just simply 10 yards, 10 rounds, 10 seconds. And again, basic is 50 points. You know, that's attainable. Advanced is going to be in the 90, 95 or better. And and I would like my, my goal for myself is to be able to do that cold um, and hit that 90 or better every time. So, uh, and, and moving on to a couple of more standards, you know, at five yards with no concealment, it's very easy to attain an A zone hit in two seconds or better, you know, so that I'll go ahead and end with those standards for now, because we weren't intending to go too far on that. But, uh, Aaron, what's your thoughts on, on, uh, the pistol and attaining proficiency? Well, you know, I kind of circle it back to um, these drills are are amazing um, to work on and judge your skills. But I would just interject that 
the most important aspect for someone to, to reach is to simply be able to present their pistol and get a round or two on target within about two seconds. Um, it, you're not going to do anything with your gun unless you present it, right? So to me, that is, um, that is the top skill to gain. And like you said, a really good place to start is to is at five yards and get shots on target, and um, because most encounters you're you're going to be within that distance five yards and under. And another couple of standard basics, um, say at seven yards from concealment, we'll be able to draw and fire one shot as a pr- presentation as you discussed in under two seconds, and then let's say a bill drill. Seven yards, six rounds, draw and fire from concealment in less than four and a half seconds. You know, that those are, are going to be challenging for a few folks, but very attainable by folks that dry fire and train on a regular basis. Well, I will definitely throw a little bit on here. This is uh, really where my, this, this is where my path started. I had owned and shot guns my entire life, and like I've said before, thought I was a shooter. Oh, little did I know. (laughs) I started going to um, a PPC class, and with the thought process that I wanted to be more proficient with my handgun, and that's where I really, you know, I wanted to be more proficient with the gun that I carried. And not only did that happen, I started competing in other courses. I started shooting other disciplines. I started improving my skills. I met people that were willing to help me improve my skills. I met people that gave me advice I didn't want. I met people that showed me how to do what I was doing better and more efficiently. And I got to say, and I'll, I'll hammer this home every time, go to your local range. Go to a shooting event and watch if you're afraid to compete or you just don't feel like you're ready for that. Go see what they're doing there because that is really, you know, that that is the hometown way to do it, man. Go find these places. Seek them out because you will be able to get this type of stuff through other means. Definitely take a registered course. If you are new to shooting entirely, there's definitely some safety stuff that you're not going to automatically pick up by watching people on the range. But once you're you're even semi-proficient and comfortable drawing your gun, you really, really should go to matches. Go to your local range, find the stuff, because that is going to be the fastest way to build your skills. Not to mention, if it's something that happens every week or twice a month or even once a month, it's some it's something to keep you coming back. Um, because I really had to be put on a schedule. I was not going to do it on myself. I was not going to just be like, hey, you know, I'm going to go to the range of practice once a week. But once I started shooting matches, I was at the range practicing every week. And then I would shoot on top of that. And that's, that's really what got me the pistol skills that I have today. Because prior to doing that, I'll, I'll be honest with you, after having owned and shot guns for a lifetime, I was nearly useless with a handgun. And now I feel as if I am actually proficient and I still have a lot of room to learn. So definitely get out there and get those comments, Brian. So I guess we can go ahead and close this segment out, but I want to go ahead and reiterate what the top five priorities for training as we prescribe it in evolution security. Number one, verbalization, de-escalation and deselection skills, or as Craig, Craig Douglas Uh, terms it managing unknown contacts Uh, or as most people know it as simply situational awareness yep yep. excellent point Aaron verbal jujitsu so um, number two physical fitness number three empty hands and or combative skills four mindset or developing mindset and lastly the pistol or or firearm So I guess that that brings us to closing out the show. And I think 
that we're going to move into accountability. Uh, Aaron, you want to go ahead and start off with accountability tonight? Sure, I'd love to. Now, I'm, I'm going to approach this a little bit different because I feel a little bit inadequate this week, so I'm just going to lay it on out here. I'm going to start with what I didn't do because, okay, as as everybody knows from the last podcast, we had just finished up ECQC, which is a pretty intense event. I um, did quite a bit of pre-training for cardio, et cetera, and, and I'll tell you, it wore me out, and, you know, just the the emotional um, toll it takes on you, I'll tell you, the week after that, I did not do much. I honestly did not do any cardio workouts last week. I wasn't motivated to do any of my reading that I should. And I, and here's another thing. I was not motivated to go to jiu-jitsu for almost a whole week, guys. I'm sorry. I did end up going last Saturday, but again... I, I was a little bit lax in, in some of those major priorities. So, again, accountability to you guys and to the audience. <laughs> but now w- what I did do is, speaking of ECQC, what I started doing was taking my notes that I quickly took in class and I started transcribing those into my training journal I've been um, the last handful of classes that I've taken, I'll take notes. And then shortly after, or usually the day after, I will go through and I will transcribe all my notes to make sure I have everything that was important in the class. So I did that. and, And I did do some of my fun gun guy stuff. I did maintain my dry daily dry fire. And, um, I did go to the range so I'm sound, I'm feeling a little guilty because I didn't do the hard stuff, but I did the fun stuff with the guns. <laughs> when I went to the range, I did did definitely come to some realization on a couple of things. I really need to get new glasses in, and I am I think tomorrow I'm making an appointment with my eye doctor to get get new glasses because it seems like the last um, few months it's gotten worse, and I can tell it. When I'm going out to 15 and 10 yards, even even at those distance, my groups are, are loosening up. But then another thing to help with these eyes, too, um, thanks to, again, Brian gives us lots of good advice on, on gun gear. He really pushed me to go ahead and get some Dawson sights, so I'm really excited. Hopefully I'll have those within the next couple of days. I got some for my 17, which is my competition and my training companion. The cool thing is if, if you've never checked out those Dawson sites, they essentially offer near near customization of your pistol sites. So, um, I mean, great company and seem to have really good customer service. So I'm looking forward to putting those on. And now um, kind of a follow-up with our, with our AR pistol episode. Last week I finally put together my AR pistol again. Thanks so much to Brian for um, helping me put that thing together. I got, I finally got all my BCM parts and my ballistic advantage 10.5 inch barrel and, and put that all together with my father-in-law. I um, took it out and shot um, at this weekly range session. Thing runs like a top um, as it should with all the good gear that's in there. Now my only issue is that I put that, you know, A2 birdcage on there. Who, that, that that's that's not going to work out for me. So I'm I'm researching comps for that. Um, it was shooting fairly fairly up and to the right, so I need to get that dialed in. But um, I believe that that's it. Now, Brian, you're you're also helping me find a um, new comp for that, aren't you? Oh, yeah. No, we're looking into a couple of options. Of course, I keep pushing him back at the battle comp, but uh, he wants to explore other options, not just because of the price, he says, but I think I think Aaron's just a little tight. Oh, yeah. Sure. So you you don't talk about how much <laughs> I spend on guitars. Before, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Before, before you stop, did you... Um, what did you do on oh, the test, yeah. thank man? You, thank you. Did you talk uh, man, about that? I was that? trying to yeah. get out of giving my accountability on that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Ah. No, my scores were okay. And I, like I usually do, I did three iterations of it. And my first, I did a 92. 
My second was an 84, and my third was a 91. I'm pretty pleased with that. Um, I think I get that a little better with with my new glasses, hopefully, um, and hopefully I'm not just using that as an excuse. But <laughs> but yeah, that's that's my accountability on that drill. Good times. Well, I'll uh, I'll pick it up there. I uh, again, I I hate to sound like the broken record, but I did. Uh, you know, for my uh, for my workout stuff, I got three CrossFit sessions, two jujitsu sessions, and one weightlifting session in. Um, still not quite my uh, my like supreme goal would be three of those each a week, but that might be more than I'm really willing to give. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really happy to have gotten where I'm at today and to be able to have the time to to commit to that and. Uh, you know, that's definitely as we move further into winter and things slow down, this my 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 workout schedule probably will increase because I'll have more time. But um, I'm definitely grateful that even in uh, for me, this is a very busy time of year. And to be able to to be able to have even the you know, because each one of those things is minimum an hour. So right there, that's six hours out of my week that I spent training, not, you know, primarily in the physical realm, but also sharpening my mind in jujitsu, sharpening my mind in weightlifting because I'm really concentrating on that stuff. And that's something I don't want to discount and make everyone else remember, you know, this is not just about getting sweaty and breathing hard. There's other things that are happening in that, you know, especially when you go into some of these skill-based types of, of trainings that you're, you're definitely pushing yourself in ways that cause your brain or your nervous system or your reaction time to change. So keep that stuff in mind. Uh, you know, when I go to CrossFit, I'm pretty much, I am pretty much just breathing hard for an hour, you know, and I'm, I'm utilizing skills, but it's not the same as when I go to jujitsu. And although I'm getting hot and sweaty and, and, you know, pushing sometimes 200 plus pound guys off of me, that's a completely different process mentally. So, you know, good to keep that in mind. But, uh, I uh, also this past weekend shot uh, our state Washington State silhouette match for uh, small bore. Um, that was in PL Washington, and uh, that is supposed to be a two day event, but I could not make it Saturday. Uh, so I shot the entire event in one day, and it was 240 shots. And again, it's just 22, but that mental focus to be up there on the line every time they call fire. Cause that's, you know, a typical match. You'll, you'll shoot a relay and take a relay off. Just, just take a break, you know, and then you'll come back and shoot your next relay. But, uh, the way that worked out for me is I shot every relay all day long and, uh, my score showed it at the end, you know, and I did okay. You know, I got, I think third in one gun and a fourth or fifth in the other, you know, I didn't place top top, but, uh, I was very happy with where I went and especially, and that's a, that's a new thing for me too, having shot that much in a day and having to maintain the focus for that long and that, that much time. So pretty cool. Um, my, uh, my test scores, <laughs> it's kind of funny saying that. And again, just, just to remind everybody, this was, you know, the 10 yards, 10 shots, 10 seconds on that B8 bull. Um, just like Aaron, I did three of them. I got, uh, an 87, a 91 and an 82. Uh, the 82 was in 8.89 seconds. That was the only one I recorded the time for. Um, they were all under the 10, but, uh, you know, I started, I started trying to push at the end there, you know, and, you know, I came out of the closet a little last time, talked about the fact that I was shooting that Maserati. Um, I left my STI three gun in the safe and I shot that with a Glock 17 Get some and standard sights and, you know, Everything was a little low and to the left, and it must be those clocks. Uh, we, we, we know what that means. <laughs> that means I'm not practicing enough on with that trigger, and that is no, exactly I mean, go, what that means. Going so, from that STI I, uh, to, to those scores on the Glock, oh, I mean, yeah. that's still awesome. No. No, I'm very. I, I was very proud of those scores it, for It's for funny, Brian, you know, I was yeah. just sitting there thinking... I'm going to give him a little bit of time here and I'm going to go, okay, did you do that with your STI or did you, did you, did you join us with our <laughs> F-150s? Yeah. 
Yep. No, but awesome. I pulled the F one fifty out. Yep. No, <laughs> it did have a threaded barrel, so that may have oh. given me a little. Advantage, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. So no, that was uh, there's there's what I did for this week, and that's you know again, I didn't hit every marker I wanted to hit for the week, but I I sure did a lot more than if I had not planned to do what I did do. And that is, again, you know, that's, I definitely want to encourage people. Don't, don't just start the week and be like, man, I'm going to see what I can get done today. I knew what I was going to do Monday. I knew what I was going to do Tuesday. I knew what I was going to do Wednesday. Now I had some work stuff come up and didn't get one of, you know, a couple of my weightliftings in, but that's, you know, that stuff happens, you know, and those were, but, but I had my one real cool thing. Like Eric does that early morning stuff. That's all my CrossFits were, um, those workouts were all completed by 6 30 a.m so that you know getting that done in the beginning of the day nothing else is in my way at that time of day and i that time is set aside to get that done you know that forces me to go to bed a little early well so be it um getting up early is the foundation of making this stuff happen so how'd you do this week eric well, um, that was all good accountability, you guys. Um, regardless, Aaron, of you're, you're getting down on yourself, but it still sounds like you got after it. And and Brian, you certainly got after it as well. You you led the way on jujitsu this week, so that's what I'll start out with. Is I didn't make it to jujitsu in this last week, so I'm uh, and and there was there's reasons for that, but uh, I'll get to make it this weekend. However, so I'll, I'll still get some jits in and be back to normal schedule the following week. So boo on me for that dry fire. I hit it three times. Um, the, this is kind of the big, big one for me. My, my morning workouts, I've only had two this week so far, but I, they, I, I changed my focus to strength again. Uh, you know, again, beating a dead horse, but we just got off ECQC and with my back injury this year and then the re-injury, I had really been babying my back and not lifting uh, for strength. And so I, I got underneath the barbell the last two workouts and man, it feels great. I'm really looking forward to, to working on strength again and my, my back's feeling a lot better. So um, that's a important uh, milestone for me again. So as far as uh, I'll just go to my test. Um, and the cool part was, was it doesn't happen as often as we had liked, but Brian and I got to shoot this together. So um, I had an 89, an 87, and a 92. And like, like Brian only recorded one and it was eight. Point three seven, and that was my 89. So um, my, my 92 was my best score, but I don't have the time for it. We were kind of moving a little bit quickly on some other stuff. But anyway, and as far as reading goes, you know what? I've been reading a couple of novels um, that I just enjoyed just sitting down and, and reading some uh, Brad Thor and Vince Flynn. I kind of like those kind of uh, CIA covert operations kind of stuff that's entertaining for me. So, so basically that was it for me. So got to improve on the jujitsu next week. Nice. Well, that's still, still getting it done though. And that's, that's what we like to remember is that, uh, this is so much more than I did three years ago. I mean, I, I I literally thought that I was doing things that I should that I that I was moving down the path that I wanted to be on, and I couldn't have been any further from the truth. You know, it is it's it's nice to to be in reality and be aware and cognizant of what we're actually capable of. So, speaking of capabilities, we're going to close it out with the uh, drill of the week, and uh, we're doing a. Uh, a little thing that we coined is five, six, seven, and this is a, this is basically a bill drill, and that's uh, you know we'll we'll switch it up here a little in the coming weeks, but uh, for today we're gonna we're gonna do, uh, you know this is again you, you can shoot this on a B eight, um, you can uh, you could shoot it on an IDPA, you know you 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 pick what you want to shoot this on, but what what we're looking for is a shots, you know we're looking for a zone shots, um, we're gonna do five yards. It's going to be six shots, and um, it's going to be timed at seven seconds. 
The intent here is uh, is to draw. We're not uh, prescribing concealed. If that's your standard MO, then go for it. But um, we're talking hip draw, so this is could be considered sport or gaming, you know. So you're going to draw, get as quickly as you can on that target, and you're going to dump those six rounds in there as tightly as you can group them in seven seconds. So five yards, six rounds, seven seconds. And if you've never done a build drill, this is you. We're trying to shoot this as fast as we can. But the intent, this is this is the this is always this is the yin yang here. The intent is to keep the group as small as possible. One of the things I noticed when I started doing build drills, you know, years ago was it was the first time I saw brass leave my gun. It was also the first time I saw a, a flash come out of the muzzle. You know, I had I'd always like just shot and, and like kind of reset. But the, the purpose of this drill is to reacquire your front sight back onto the target in the same spot it was when you released the previous round. So what, what we're working on is getting that speed up. And this is a great way to do it. Who cares how big your group is? I don't. Nobody, nobody standing by is gonna, it, depending on the range you're at, they may yell at you for fast firing. Hopefully that's not a problem where you shoot, um, because there is a purpose in this drill. It's not just burning down ammo. And when I very first started doing these, I was shooting five to eight inch groups and, um, happy to say that, you know, I can get these down in, you know, three to four inches shooting fast. If I kind of time myself and use all of the time on the clock, I can get them down into a couple inches. Um, and that's, you know, sometimes even smaller, but that's really kind of the, 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 we don't really need to go any farther than that for the, for this drill. But if you can keep them all in an A zone on an IDPA target, that's great. If you can keep them all in the black on a B8 bull, you know, in that eight ring, that's all we're looking for here. We are not, this is not about shooting X's. This is about getting your sights back and getting the bullets down range. So last time, five yards, six shots, seven seconds, come back and report to us, you know? Yeah. And I just wanted to interject um, some feedback from a listener I got was that that maybe some of these drills were prescribing them as too easy. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, and the point was, was uh, I, I know this shooter, and he's a very good shooter, an, an excellent shooter. But the point is, um, we're all pretty good shooters. But one of the main tenets of evolution security in this podcast is to in, encourage average people to do better than they are today, right? So I, I just want to make that clear in, in how we prescribe these drills. They are intended for us and the audience to do them together and to get better together. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So, and I had one more thing that came to mind. We've had some really amazing guests in in the um, in the last in the previous episodes. And um, we've had some great shows, but I, I'm just excited, guys, about the the guests that we actually have scheduled to record in the next few weeks. Man, I'm really excited about it. Some some really good guests. Oh, I'm jazzed, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to that a Me lot. Me too. Well, I think that finishes it up. Anything else, guys? I'm good here. Good here and just... Um, just you guys have a safe night out there, you know, 1,500 miles away from me. <laughs> Fair enough, man. Take All care, right. Aaron. Hey, until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.